Thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and, and tell you about quantum computing, a subject that I've worked on by now for more than 20 years. And um, I'm, I'm sometimes curious, you know, for how many more decades before the quantum computer will be there, as you may be curious. Uh, and that's part of what I would indeed like to, to, to discuss today. Um, I think that in this audience of developers, we are certainly in agreement with the enormous progress that's been made in computation. Um, if you, there is almost no comparison between the abacus or, or mechanical machines of the 1800s to machines based on vacuum tubes or transistors. Uh, the integrated circuit or the supercomputer where massively parallel uh, uh, processing is possible and, and enormous complexity uh, is, is mastered. But I want you to note that all of these machines, as different they may be, in the end rely on what we call the classical laws of physics. These are Newton's laws that describe how objects move, or uh, Maxwell's laws that describe electricity and electromagnetic waves. And in the end, it is clear that an apple will be either here or there, but never in both places simultaneously. A current may run through a circuit or not run through it, but not simultaneously run through the circuit and not. This is common sense. It's common sense, it's the, it's the sense of the classical world, as we call it, it's the world that we observe every day around us. And that's what we've therefore become acquainted with, it's, it's where our intuition lies. But if we think about computation in a rather profound way, it's really worth asking, can we do better? Is this all there is to computation? The laws of Newton and Maxwell. And in fact, it may be possible to do better. It may be possible that currents run through two branches at the same time. In fact, it is possible, it's been observed. So here is a micron scale metal ring cooled down to very low temperatures. We're already in the 80s. It was observed that as a function of the magnetic field going through this loop, the current showed oscillations and physicists interpreted these as a result of the current flowing through the left arm and the right higher arm together. Okay, so far that's pretty normal. It's just a parallel circuit. But it's more than that. It's every electron that passes through that passes through both arms simultaneously. This is our only way of understanding this data. Every single electron takes both paths and interferes with itself. What you're looking at are interference fringes. So observations like these led the famous physicist Richard Feynman to fantasize, to imagine a computer that actually exploited the possibility of currents flowing through two ways, through, through two arms simultaneously. And he asked, may this possibly allow us to compute much faster than any other machine in the world could do. And in the beginning, it was mostly a, a speculation, but over the years, many people in our field have laid first a theoretical framework for showing that this may be possible, and later laid the experimental foundations, the technological foundations, based on which we now think that indeed, it should be possible to compute in a radically different way from any of the classical machines that we have, whether it's our brain, a supercomputer, or a mechanical machine, and thereby solve problems that are simply beyond the reach of any classical machine. The potential implications are quite broad. Here are a few examples that are really firmly established in the scientific community where a quantum speedup can be achieved. First is, the simulation of materials and molecules, which today consumes a large part of all of the supercomputing super power in the world. The problems in what we call quantum chemistry are highly relevant for chemical plants, for 
catalysts for uh, drug design. Problems in material science are highly relevant for batteries, for uh, energy storage, energy transfer, uh, light harvesting, solar cells. And it turns out that even the most powerful supercomputers can only give approximate solutions to these problems. And as a result, this possible, it is currently not possible to predict by computer whether some candidate molecule will be a good uh, drug, will be an efficient medicine. Or it is not possible currently to design by a computer a material that has no electrical resistance at room temperature, a zero or a room temperature superconductor. It's been a dream for decades, and, and computers, current computers cannot help us with these problems. Quantum computers can. There is a famous um, algorithm by Peter Shore, 1994, that shows that a widely used encryption scheme, RSA, can be broken using quantum computers. It's, basic, it's based on the fact that prime factoring, which is thought to be hard, exponentially hard on classical computers, is efficiently solvable on a quantum computer. When you read the newspapers, there are many other possible applications. Some of them well-founded, others highly speculative, uh, from you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, to optimization, uh, logistics, um, financial services, and so forth. So it remains to be seen uh, really, which of these are going to turn out to be real applications? But already the expectations are high. And when the Nobel Committee in, in 2012 decided to award the Nobel Prize in Physics to two of our colleagues in the field, they made a pretty big statement, setting high expectations, that the quantum computer may change our everyday lives in the same way as the classical computer has done in the last century. And of course, we know what a tremendous revolution this brought about. So here are the two Nobel laureates. They received the Nobel Prize for really pioneering work on grabbing and isolating individual atoms or ions and controlling and measuring the state of one atom or one ion at a time at the quantum level. You know, is, the, is this one single atom in the ground state, the lowest energy state, or in some excited state? Can we prepare it in this superposition that I spoke about? The answer is yes, right, and so forth. So here is our, our mental picture of what a quantum bit looks like. A quantum bit is the, the equivalent of, of a bit in conventional computing. And just like in conventional computing, um, where you know, we, we use a binary representation of information. We need some physical system to host the quantum bits. We don't use uh, you know, transistors in, in a conventional way. Um, the prototypical quantum bit that we work with is what we call an electron spin. Many of you may know that an electron has a property called spin. That, that is magnetic. It's, you can think of it as the tiniest compass needle that you can build or that you can imagine. And we can visualize the state of this compass needle by an arrow that points in a certain direction. And what is the case is that if you do a measurement of such a spin, the answer will always be spin up or spin down, pointing upwards or downwards, never anything else. But any other state is also allowed, and only by measuring do you affect it, do you change it. We call it projected to either the spin up or the spin down state. So these other states I can, like I said, visualize with my arm pointing in a certain direction. But as physicists, we really want to emphasize that it's very different from an arrow pointing in a well-defined direction. For us, it's really, at that point, a quantum superposition of up and down. We write it like this linear combination, and the funny brackets here indicate that we're talking about quantum states. And um, any linear combination here is allowed, as long as the, you know, the, the amplitude in the end is 1, uh, or, or a squared plus b squared together has to be 1. 
And that, that is really how we need to think about it. So now, in terms of bits, you know, this becomes the zero, the spin down becomes the one, and then any combination, any linear combination, superposition of zero and one is allowed. Simultaneously zero and one. With two spins, you might wonder, why do I make this distinction, right? Does it make sense? Is it helpful? And it becomes more clear if we look at multiple uh, qubits or quantum bits. If one quantum bit can be simultaneously in the state zero and, zero and one, then two quantum bits together can be in a superposition of the states zero, zero through one, one. Three quantum bits can be in the superposition zero, 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 one through one, one, one. With four, you have 16 possibilities all in superposition and so forth. And so what you see is that for every bit that I add, the number of possible states included in this superposition doubles. And it, does, it takes only 50 qubits, where there are 2 to the power 50 complex numbers, coefficients in front of these terms, before no supercomputer that exists today uh, can store that state anymore. Okay, so there, there is not enough room in the memory of a supercomputer to store 2 to the 50 complex amplitudes. If supercomputers became overnight a thousand times more powerful, it would only shift this threshold by 10 qubits, right? And, and then 60 qubits would already be larger than the largest supercomputer can hold. So it's, it's very, very powerful. But this is not the whole story. In order to make use of superpositions, we need specially designed algorithms that allow to explore a, a computation over many possibilities in parallel. And I like to visualize this, and I'm hoping this is going to work on the big screen. Great. Visualize this as follows. Let's imagine that we want to escape from a maze. As human beings, or, or with classical balls, the best we can do is attempt one path and backtrack if, if we get a dead end and, and try again. And eventually, you know, after eliminating a number of paths, we find the exit. A quantum computer, in contrast, can explore all paths simultaneously. And very quickly, we'll be able to find the exit. That's the main idea. So this, of course, is a little bit simplified, right? But it captures, it captures the idea. Um, so this being a developer's conference, I want to make an attempt to dig a bit, a bit deeper into how quantum algorithms really work. Um, because in some years, hopefully, some of you or many of you will be programming quantum computers. The first thing we do, and this is an example for, for Grover's algorithm. Uh, it goes back to 1996. It's described as, as a search algorithm. Imagine that you have a function that's easy to evaluate, but hard to invert. And you're giving some, some output state, and you want to know the corresponding input state. That's where you can use this algorithm. You're searching for the input that maps onto the desired output state. The first thing you do is, this is an example with three bits, three qubits, and you prepare all of them in a superposition. So you've got now the eight states in superposition. Then you evaluate your function. And the function evaluation flips the sign of one of them. Function evaluation, like I said, is easy here. Notice that in order to evaluate the function, I don't need to know in advance which of these amplitudes will be flipped. Right? I'm, I'm actually interested to find out which of them it flips. I just have a description of the function. I can evaluate it. But I don't know yet for every input what output it produces. Then I do um, some more operations. Um, I will first apply an inversion to the, about the average. So if you take the average amplitude of all of these amplitudes here and invert around it, then you will see that those ones are a bit above the average. This one is below. And so this one gets amplified, and the others get smaller. And we repeat this a second time. We invert and then flip around the average. 
And we see now that the amplitude of the 101 entry has been boosted, it's been amplified. If we now do a measurement of the three quantum bits with high likelihood, the measurement will return this entry, because that's where most of the weight is. And, and then we know, you know what, the, what the answer to the problem was. Namely, um, it is the 101 input state that, when you evaluate the function, maps to another output compared to the others. Did this uh, somehow make sense? No? OK, an honest, honest answer here in the front. Uh, no? Um, let me um, maybe mention a few things that are the key ingredients of, of why this works. Um, the first is that we start with all the bits uh, in superposition, so you, they all have a finite amplitude. At the end, one of the amplitudes is boosted at the expense of the others. This is a result of interference, quantum interference. And it happens in all the algorithms. So the final state is one where one amplitude stands out. And if you do a measurement, you will, with high likelihood, get back the right result. Notice that since the function was easy to evaluate, we can quickly check whether this candidate result is indeed the true answer. OK, I'd be happy to discuss more afterwards if, if, there are, uh, if you want to dig deeper. So now, similar to classical computing, there is uh, several steps between the abstract description of an algorithm to some compiled version and eventually machine language and then down to the level of transistors and currents flowing through them. And the, inter the first intermediate step in our field is to write down what we call a quantum circuit. And I want to mention this here because it illustrates also another way in which quantum bits are different from ordinary bits. In ordinary computing, the transistors are fixed in place, fixed, you know, they're fixed positions on the chip, and currents travel around. Typically, in quantum computing, the bits are fixed in place. So, so, so I should say that the currents in classical computers, that's where the information is, not the bits. Here, the bits stay in place, and we program them by sending control signals. Control signals, I will make it more concrete later, where you flip a spin or make two qubits interact with each other. So what happens to one depends on the other. That's the basis for logic. And, and this is visualized here. The horizontal axis is a time axis. There are five quantum bits. And you see that we start with these operations. We call them Hadamard operations. They take the zero to an equal superposition of zero and one. And then we do an operation on these two quantum bits that depends on the state of this one, and so forth. Right? So this is just a graphical representation showing you how we break down the algorithm into a sequence of steps acting on the quantum bits. And at the end, we read out a relevant subset of the quantum bits. Making this one step more concrete, when you aim to build a quantum computer, like me, you want to identify a quantum system that has two well-defined states to be used as the zero and the one. You want to make it such that you can build many copies. It needs to be scalable. Um, trivial in classical computation, not necessarily here. You need a means to put each quantum bit in a well-defined initial state. Of course, you need to compute with it. And just like the NAND gate is universal for classical computers, there is also a set of gates that are universal for quantum computers. The NAND is not sufficient. The NAND can never prepare a superposition, so you need something more. But it turns out that if you can act on one qubit at a time and, and, and have a logical operation that involves the neighbors, where, where, again, what happens to one depends on the state of the other, if you have that, that's sufficient for universal computation. And of course, you need to read out the final state. Now, besides the challenge of scalability and control, a major difficulty in actually building quantum computers is what we call decoherence. These superpositions that I spoke about turn out to be extremely fragile. The slightest influence from the environment may perturb the state much more than is the case for the classical bit, where you know if, if it's let's say, 5 volts and 0 volts, if that's the 1 and the 0, well, 4.7 will still count as 1. 
right? And, and 0 0.4 may still count as a zero. But here, since we're working in this more continuous space, any small influence may cause problems. So really, the grand challenge in our field, as I see it, is to build quantum bits that live forever, of the states of which are preserved for as long as we need to complete the computation. And it has to happen in a system that we can scale up. And, and that's hard. So, so to make a system that lives forever, typically what you want is quantum bits that are living in vacuum and don't interact with anything else. You, you just remove the environment, and then for sure they will be you know, unaffected. But we cannot really do that because we need access to the quantum bits. We need to be able to bring in the control signals that um, set the steps in the computation we need to learn what the state is of the qubits when we want to read them out. So somehow isolation is desired to preserve coherence and access is required to compute and read the state. It's not easy to bring these together and, and we're working in our community on the best compromise between them. And so, so this, this idea that you want to quant keep quantum states alive forever, I, I like to visualize with this famous Leto by the Dutch artist Escher, right, the internal staircase, where the decoherence process means you kind of go down the drain, right? You, things go, you go down stairs, you just lose coherence, you just go down the stairs, but magically you come back to where you started. So that's, that's really what, what we need. Okay, so with this challenge, you will still hear me say today, and actually not 10 years ago, that I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic that quantum computers may happen on a, on a, um, on a relevant scale. Here's why. Three reasons. The first, in terms of scalability, I think a major advance in our field is that with a variety of methods, and here are just some examples from, from um, my colleagues and myself in Delft, we have learned to build quantum bits, to control them, to read them out, on a chip. On a chip using technology that's actually, in some cases, remarkably close to the technology of today's semiconductor industry. And that's an extremely powerful technology with you know, multi, multi-billion dollar investments in perfecting it in demonstrated capability of, of large complexity in, in integrated circuits. And so I think that's a great starting point, that we can do this on a chip, not just with atoms in vacuum or some other laboratory setting. Second, we have learned to design materials and engineer materials such that the lifetimes of the quantum bits, we call them the coherence times, have been extended by four orders of magnitude. This is an example for the case where spins in small semiconductor structures are used as quantum bits. It's, it's my favorite, it's the one that I work on. Um, so four orders of magnitude improvements, um, and I would say similar improvements in, in coherence time and lifetime have, have been realized with other approaches. And so this is a field where there are still several competing approaches uh, progressing and where we will find out over time which one achieves this trade-off the best. Third, even with these improved lifetimes, it is the case that there will remain errors. And, and a computer that contain, or, or, where errors occur is fine as long as you can correct them faster than they occur. And we know that this was possible in, in theory already since the late 1990s. But the demands for doing so were extremely severe and, and possibly a bit beyond what could be feasible. Namely, you could afford only one error for every 10,000 operations you did. And, and looking back, maybe it's quite interesting that we didn't already give up right then. Um, <laughs> But, you know, there is progress. Um, some five to 10 years ago, 
new theoretical advances showed us that this threshold can be just a percent. And that's actually something that for some of the operations we already reach, and for others we, we think, well, we, we actually know how to get there. A percent is possible. We can do this. I do need to note that the redundancy involved is significant. Okay, so, so similar to classical computers, you like to you build in some redundancy. Um, a spin-up would be represented by three spin-ups and a spin-down by three spin-downs. This superposition becomes the superposition of all up and up, all down. If you, if you then take a majority vote and, and compare the spins, then, then you can guess which one is the right answer and so forth. But it turns out that, that we may need 100 or even 1,000 or 10,000 actual physical quantum bits to encode one quantum bit that, is, that we call a logical quantum bit. It's the one that you talk about in the quantum algorithms, this abstract quantum bit. So that's a very large overhead. Um, and, and that's why, why the integration on a solid-state circuit, I think, is critical. All right. So I prepared a few slides to make things more, more tangible, more physical. Maybe I'm going to mostly skip over that uh, for the sake of time. Oh, sorry, that was a bit too fast. And, and come, come here. So if it is the case that I'm so optimistic now, then you know, why don't we have quantum computers yet? What is standing in the way? And, and of course, one part of the answer with any new development is it takes time. OK, and that's true. Uh, you know. But I want to be a bit more concrete. The first is that, as I like to say, qubits have personalities. They're all a little bit different when we build them. And it means that we spend a lot of time tweaking, calibrating, compensating, and learning to deal with the inhomogeneities. And um, it's something that we need to get away from. I mean, I, I like personalities, right? This room full of personalities, but not for qubits. We want them to be as identical as they can be. And, and so I think that the way to go really is to use not university style nanofabrication facilities, clean rooms, but industry clean rooms, get access to the best clean rooms there are in the world, where the chances of having you know, control over defects, over uniformity, over patterning is, is just the best, the highest. You know, you, it's not going to get better than that. And so that's what we need to bring in. And, and that's why I'm very excited that um, almost four years ago now, we started a very close collaboration with Intel, where um, they, they fund us significantly. $15 million is for a university group, a lot of money. It covers these semiconductor qubits, silicon qubits that I work on, also other types of qubits, superconducting qubits. It covers work on architecture. How do you then you know, make this step from the, al from the abstract algorithm to the concrete quantum bits? What's, there, you know, what's in between that architecture and the control? Um, and so, but, but so I want to say that even though we welcome the significant funding more unique and important in a way for us is that on top of that, Intel brings in its own expertise, its know-how and people, engineers, to produce quantum bits with a technology, well, with their industrial technology. And so, so here is an image of a transistor, not the most modern one, where there is a gate electrode separating two contacts. And the voltage here controls how many, well, controls the flow of electrons through the channel. And here you see an, an, an image of multiple gate electrodes, where some of them are po bi biased positively, so they attract electrons, and others negative, so they repel electrons. And we can prepare or create a potential landscape where electrons like to be in the potential minima and not in the barrier regions. 
it turns out that it's actually possible to do this and go to the regime where there is one single electron here, one here, one here, and the spin of each of those electrons is a quantum bit for us. So this is happening. Second, here is an image of, of one of our labs. It's still very much cluttered and, you know, lots of laboratory-style general-purpose equipment, uh, wires, and, and so forth. And, and this is what you need at this moment to control just a few quantum bits. And obviously, we need a technology that is scalable all the way from the qubits up to the higher levels of abstraction. And so, um, with my colleagues in Delft, we've been working hard on designing a scalable approach to, the, to generating all the control signals that steer the computation and, and read out the signals. Um, as well as designing an architecture to, to have, you know, that includes compilers and, and runtime and uh, synchronization and, and so forth. A third challenge, and this is one especially for you, is, you know, what is a quantum computer in the end good for? I had this quote from the Nobel Committee, and I gave these examples of materials and molecules and cracking RSA. And, well, I have to say, cracking RSA does not motivate me very much. Uh, but, but, you know, making progress in, in materials and molecules could have very far-reaching implications, so I'm extremely motivated by it. But I think many in the field feel that there is more opportunity. And, like I said, there is a lot of speculation. Um, here you see, uh, you know, a number of fields that are, that are talked about. But for the most part, these are, you know, kind of loose ideas. For instance, quantum machine learning. Well, even classical machine learning, as you know, possibly better than me, is, it's, it's not so well understood really how it works and what the scaling is. It's just clear that it works phenomenally well for a number of applications and, and better over time. But the theoretical foundations and limits are not yet very clear, I think. And for the quantum case, at the moment, it's mostly this hope that quantum is different and then maybe it's better. But that's not good enough, right? We, we need to try it out. We need to understand it better. Um, we need to work this out better. And, and the same is true for many other applications that people talk about. In the newspapers, you hear about you know, optimization and about logistics and scheduling and what have you. And, and in most cases, it's, it's based on, on assumptions that are not yet scientifically uh, checked or, or verified or demonstrated. So there is real work for coming up with new use cases, applications, and coming up with algorithms that then make, make use of this quantum parallelism to solve the problems faster than is possible otherwise. And it's hard to do. So I hope some of you maybe will get interested in, and start looking at this and thinking about it and, and hopefully contribute. One way to go about it in my mind is to provide online access to quantum bits so that those interested can experiment and play and and try things out and, and see what works and doesn't and, and get a feel. And, and we've done that in Delft. We have an online platform uh, that we launched this September. It is called Quantum Inspire. Here's the website. I hope you will visit. Um, and, and at the moment, you can program perfect qubits. These are simulated qubits, simulated on a classical computer. Um, uh, on, on a supercomputer if you want access to more than a few. Um, it's a way to get started. Later this year, we plan to bring online real qubits based on silicon. And I want to mention that IBM actually has had real qubits online already for a number of years. These are superconducting circuits, uh, one of the competing approaches. And, and you can also visit their website, IBM Q, and experiment. The you know, maybe to, to tempt you just one step more, here's um, a program, <laughs> right? I could have had a command line also. Um, and, and you can, you know, just type in 
uh, code. It's, it's uh, for instance, Python-based within some, some typical names that correspond to quantum operations and so forth. There is uh, a whole knowledge base. You can, you can really learn by visiting the website how to, how to do this. And so I hope you will take advantage. So I think from what I've described, it's clear that a quantum computer, like any, quantum, like any computer, is a complex system that consists of layers all the way from building the quantum bits, this is my life uh, work, uh, to, to the control electronics, having the error correction on top of that, and uh, the, you know, some, some, some instruction set architecture, compiling, runtime, up to the algorithms. And what has become clear from trying to bring everything together in this quantum inspire platform is that trade-offs in one layer affect trade-offs in the other layer. It's, it's interrelated. So you really need a systems engineering approach to, to optimize the whole. And that's what we're doing. Um, you need many people and a broad range of expertises to do so. And in Delft, we have had, I can say, for a few decades, a very strong expertise, um, really you know, recognized around the world, in, in quantum physics on a chip, let's say, in these nanoscale structures. Um, but a number of years, more than five years ago, with several colleagues, we realized that in order to keep advancing the field, we were going to have to make a change and involve other disciplines, involve uh, uh, electrical engineers, computer scientists, software engineers, both from the academic world and professionals. Professionals who can focus on getting something done instead of on the next publication or a PhD thesis. And so out of this came, oh, that's uh, not very high resolution here, uh, came QTEC, a partnership between TU Delft and TNO. Uh, TU Delft is one of the technical universities in the Netherlands. TNO is the Netherlands Organization for Applied Research. They have great engineering expertise in many fields. And we've been working very fruitfully together. We have also engaged industry. I mentioned Intel. Colleagues of mine work closely with Microsoft. Microsoft even built a lab in Delft. We, are, we have startup companies. We have SMEs setting up uh, a, a facility in Delft. What we try to do, and it's happening, is to build a quantum campus in Delft where, where it becomes really attractive for everyone to come because that's where things are happening. So maybe some of you will also like to join. So then coming back to the question that we started with, OK, so when will there be a quantum computer? I'm sure you're interested. Um, here are some examples showing um, the world is interested in this question, right? And indeed, when you read the newspapers, you read everything from it's already there till it will happen next year or 10 years from now or 20 years ago uh, uh, from now. Um, so what is, what is really going on? I would say it's a little bit of truth. There is a little bit of truth in everything. First of all, already today, little or small scale quantum computers exist. You know, in my own group, we have run Quantum algorithms, this Grover's algorithm that I've discussed in the beginning, this search algorithm and other algorithms, we've seen in the lab that they work. So it's not just talk, but it's only on a small scale so far, on a modest, modest scale of a few quantum bits. So from that point of view, you could say, well, the quantum computer already exists. Or you could say, well, it doesn't yet solve anything useful, so it doesn't exist. And there are different points of view, no more than that. Um, I think what you're going to see over time is the number of quantum bits steadily increasing. It will be not so long, maybe one or two years, before this concept of fault tolerance is really convincingly demonstrated. This would mean that by adding redundancy, by having more quantum bits present, you get net a longer lifetime. That's not trivial, because if you add more quantum bits, there could be more errors, right? More quantum bits are subjected to more errors. So do you win or do you lose? And, and the answer, well, on paper, is you, you win. And hopefully, we will also see that in experiment in the next one or two years. 
Um, it's not on the slide here, but another thing that's coming is that, uh, that you will see quantum bits with 50, 60, 70, sorry, quantum computers with 50, 60, 70 quantum bits, which means that their complexity no longer fits in the memory of a supercomputer. No supercomputer will be able to do what these quantum bits will be doing, or to simulate what these quantum bits will be doing. The first demonstrations of this will be as follows. The quantum bits will be subject to a sequence, literally, of random operations. If you apply a sequence of random operations to a bunch of bits, classical or quantum, you expect something random at the end, and that's what's going to happen. And that's not very useful. Right? We have num random number generators in, in much more uh, simple ways than, than building a 60-qubit machine. Um, but the point is that no classical computer will be able to compute the same random outcome. So in that sense, there will be a powerful quantum machine, even though it doesn't solve any relevant or useful problem. So I would also say that with all the ideas that we have today, and that have been demonstrated today, we don't know how to scale to the many thousands or millions of quantum bits that eventually will be needed, or, or will, will, may be needed. Um, but so, so I put here a bit you know, tentatively, maybe in 2025, we'll, we'll have shown a path, this scales. It's just hard work now, but it, it's, it's going to work. Of course, in our community, we work hard to go faster. And, and we'll see how this develops, right? So these data points are semi-quantitative, of course, always with a grain of salt, and we'll see how this develops. But then the question is, when do we have enough quantum bits? When do we really do something useful? And this usefulness threshold, if we rely on quantum error correction and think about simulating materials or cracking RSA, that usefulness threshold is up in the millions, many millions. But already what we've seen is that, for, that there have been significant advances in error correction, and, and so that this overhead comes down. And we also hope that there are advances in algorithms. And there is this famous proposition by John Preskill of Caltech, who talks about near scale, um, sorry, no, sorry, about noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. The hyphen is in the wrong place here. Noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. So intermediate scale, let's say 50 to 100 quantum bits. Noisy meaning they are subject to decoherence and we don't correct the errors. And the big question is, can we make those 100 qubits solve a relevant problem? And we don't know. We hope so, but we don't know. Maybe it's speculative. Well, it is speculative. Um, so. So then, when will we have a quantum computer? In my mind, it is when these two lines meet, when we have reached a number of qubits that matches this usefulness threshold. And as you can tell from this story, I don't know, and nobody knows, but, but that's where it's going to happen, right? So will the quantum computer be there? I, I hope so. Uh, many companies are seriously investing um, I mentioned uh, Intel, I mentioned Microsoft, IBM, Google has, is working on this experiment, uh, trying to, to, to have uh, more than 50 qubits that no classical computer can simulate. There are startups in this field, uh, other companies. Uh, so in anticipation, I already have this nice hat, spins inside, and with this, uh, let me emphasize that it is really a team effort, and thank you for your attention. Thank you.